and addiction. Sorry, Rob. That's all right. We'll be live in just a moment here. Thank you. All right. You're good to go, Heather. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the first uh, Gray County Mental Health and Addictions Task Force meeting. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Heather Morrison. I am the county clerk. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, we have all members in attendance with the exception of Councillor Clumpus, who indicated she will be joining us a bit later. Um, because it's the very first task force meeting of this group, I'd like to do some just around the table uh, quick introductions so that everyone knows uh, who everyone else is. So again, as I said, my name is Heather Morrison and I am the clerk for Gray County. Um, I'm gonna go around my virtual horseshoe here and start with uh, Councillor Burley. Hi, I'm uh, Dw Dwight Burley, County Councillor, Mayor of Georgia and Bluffs. Thank you very much. Councillor Hutchinson. Hi, good afternoon, I'm Tom Hutchinson. I am uh, County Council and I'm uh, the Deputy Mayor of West Gray. Thank you, Councillor Carlton. Thank you, I'm Sue Carlton, County Councillor and Deputy Mayor of Georgian Bluffs. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Scott Mackey, a mayor of the township of Chatsworth and a great county councillor. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodd. Hello, everyone. I am Phil Dodd, the executive director of Keystone Child, Youth and Family Services. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Brian O'Leary, Deputy Mayor Owen Sound, Great County Councilor. Thank you very much. Director McNabb. Hey, Kevin McNabb, Great County Paramedic Services. Thank you. Director Fady. Good afternoon. Barb Fady, Great County Social Services Director. Thank you. Warden Hicks. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Selwyn Hicks. I like to be called Bob, so feel free to call me Bob if you don't know me. And I'm the warden for the County of Gray and Deputy Mayor for the Town of Hamilton. Thank you. CAO Wingrove. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kim Wingrove, Gray County CAO. Thank you. Ms. Bodden. <clears throat> Hi, Naomi Bodden, Director of Mental Health and Addictions at Gray Bruce Health Services. Thank you. Dr. Era. Ian Era, Medical Officer of Health for Gray Bruce Health Unit. Thank you. Ms. Govier. Hi, I'm Allison Govier. I'm the coordinator of the Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy in Gray and Bruce Counties. Thank you. Councillor Keaveny. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shirley Keaveny, County Councillor and Deputy Mayor of the Municipality of Mayfield. Thank you. Councillor Klumpas. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barb Klumpas. I'm the Mayor of the Municipality of Meaford and the County Councillor. Thank you very much. Mr. McFarland. Hello, my name is Clark McFarland. I'm the CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association, Gray Bruce, uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services. Thank you. Director Shaw. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Anne-Marie Shaw, Director of Community Services for Gray. Thank you. Ms. McClay Winters. Good afternoon. I'm Sandra McClay Winters. I'm a standing member of the Peer Advisory Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Deputy Clerk. Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Warder. I'm the Deputy Clerk for Gray County. We receive agendas and minutes and meeting invitations from you. Thank you. And from our Gray County Communications, we have uh, Rob Hatton, who is running the Zoom meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the election of the chair and the vice chair uh, who will oversee the uh, meetings from here until the task force is complete. So I'm going to open the floor to nominations for the chair of the Great, of Great County's Mental Health and Addictions Task Force. Councillor Burley. I nominate uh, Councillor Brian O'Leary as chair. Thank you, do I have a seconder? Councillor Carlton, thank you. Hicks. Sorry, I think I had my hand up. Do I? Um, yes, I, I completely support 
uh, Councillor O'Leary, but I would also like to nominate uh, Councillor Mackey. Okay, thank you. Do I have a seconder for Councillor Mackey? Councillor Keaveny, thank you. Are there any other nominations for chair? Seeing none, could I have a motion please to close nominations? Councillor Hutchinson, thank you very much. Councillor O'Leary, are you willing to stand for chair? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. Councillor Mackey, are you willing to stand for chair? I appreciate uh, the nomination, but I will withdraw my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor O'Leary, you've been acclaimed as chair for the Mental Health and Addiction Task Force. Congratulations. Thank you. Bill. Now open the floor for nominations for vice chair. Councilor Carlton. I would nominate Councilor Mackey for vice chair. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councilor Hutchinson. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Could I please have a motion to close nominations? Councilor Burley, thank you. Councillor Mackey, are you willing to stand for vice chair? Yes, Madam Clerk, I will stand as vice chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Mackey, you are acclaimed as the vice chair of the Mental Health and Addictions Task Force. Congratulations. And with that, uh, Chair O'Leary, I will pass the meeting over to you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And thank you to my nominator, Councillor Burley. And congratulations to Councillor Mackey. And good afternoon, everyone. We'll move right along here to the agenda. A number three declaration of interest. Are there any declarations? Seeing none, if one pops up along the way, you can declare at that time. Uh, introductions, I guess we've already done that. We'll move right on to number five with our terms of reference and introduce CAO Kim Wingo. Kim, floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Included in your package uh, for today's meeting was the terms of reference that uh, was put before um, County Council at our last meeting um, and, and adopted, but certainly we're open to uh, discussion of that terms of reference. Uh, this afternoon, you can see here, I'll just go over a few of the, of the key points in it. Um, this task force is responsible for working with levels of government and community stakeholders to identify opportunities for enhanced community supports for mental health and substance use disorders in Gray County. At this point, we've identified uh, four objectives for the committee's work um, to focus on our community members living with mental health and addictions challenges, particularly youth and insecurely housed or unhoused transient neighbors to bring together government, non-government, health and community partners to understand and enable the delivery of interdisciplinary care focused on improving health equity through innovative approaches to meet the needs of our most vulnerable community members in a timely, meaningful and reliable way. To determine appropriate advocacy to various levels of government for increased access to services and reducing barriers to these services. And finally, to make recommendations for or to take immediate action focused programs that meet people where they are at to provide person centered health and wraparound care in order to improve health outcomes and health equity of individuals who are experiencing barriers to health and social services in Gray County. Uh, the terms of reference goes on to note that while Gray County doesn't have a direct role in the provision of health, mental health and substance use treatment, um, the lack of appropriate treatment or support services has a direct impact on both the services that the county is responsible for, things like paramedic services, social housing, um, social services, and also into our, each of our individual member communities. So the task force will work with other levels of government to seek out greater access to mental health and substance use disorder services, funding options and solutions to assist in the development of a local strategy aimed at prioritizing short and long-term solutions for Gray. 
So we've talked about the membership around this table. We have a number of county councillors and the warden and the public stakeholders that have agreed to join us. And we're so thankful to all of you for um, lending your time, which I know is scarce, and your expertise to this table. We can't be successful without you. So thank you all so very, very much for being willing to step forward and, and be a part of this discussion. Um, the terms of reference goes on to say, each member will exercise the care, diligence, and skill um, that any reasonable person would exercise to become informed in the area of mental health and addiction support services if you don't come to the table with already a deep knowledge. Take the necessary measures to ensure um, that anything that we do complies with legislation and be committed to achieving and maintaining the vision, mission, and values of the county. So joining us today or on this team, um, in addition to those that were formally introduced, Allison Govier, uh, who I think is well known to everyone, and, and Darren, Kevin, Darren's not with us today, is he? He actually ended up calling in. I'm pretty sure he's on now. Oh, I see. Okay, Darren, you just want to say hi? So, uh, if I don't know if D Darren's, yeah, there he is. There hi. Darren. hi, it's Darren. Nice to meet you all. Thanks. And, and Darren um, has really played an instrumental role in uh, a number of the outreach initiatives um, that were undertaken as part of the whole COVID response. And uh, I think that'll become clear and when we have a chance to hear from the first responder group, um, of which uh, he is a part. So that's our terms of reference. Um, did anyone have um, any questions about the terms of reference for the committee's work? Any suggestions, anything like that? It's really important that we all have a shared understanding. Is that, do I see your hand, Clark? Yes, thanks. Um, just one thing, just uh, very minor, but um, my name is M.A.C. Oh, goodness. McFarland. Um, the other is, <clears throat> I noticed in the terms of reference, you know, there's a theme of uh, improving access to services. And if we can just have access to services, if we go away, I think, um, I think we may need to be open to looking at some larger structural issues uh, mm -hmm. and recognize that. Um, although, although services may be available, um, it's always the individual's choice as to whether to access. So um, it, it, is, it, is, um, it is a complex uh, issue uh, with, with many layers. Um, certainly the, you know, the, the appropriateness of the, of the services or how we, the configuration of our resources right now uh, is, is I think, uh, a productive topic, but I just I just wanted to make that point that I, I don't want to over wouldn't want people to walk in to, with an oversimplified view of if we can just make things accessible, it'll all go away. Um, there, there are some some big structural issues. Thank you so much for that, Clark. And I think it's an, an excellent point that we're coming into this as the county looking to understand from the people who have the subject matter expertise. So you're right that there is the, a little bit of a flavor of a preconceived, there's certain, just not enough services for everyone. But I think what we're looking for from each one of, of the subject matter experts is your sense of, of what the, both the barriers and the and challenges as well as the opportunities are when it comes to addressing what we see. And, and sorry, uh, Dr. Ara, just one supplemental. I was very pleased, if I, if I recall, I did read something about uh, design and healthy communities. And, and I thought that was wonderful to see in the terms of reference and very forward thinking of the council um, and, and, and so important to, uh, to consider, so. So Kim, if I could, I, I just wanted to um, share with the rest of the committee, um, you know, I put a lot of thought into the terms of reference and I've, I've gone over the, the four of them and I've come up with my own um, as a fifth that I wanted to share with, with committee and to get a feel and maybe an explanation or a question or comment from, from the rest of the committee. I kind of feel like it's the, 
affordable housing day when we when we thought we were doing something really bold, adding a full percentage to the to the levy. Uh, but this would, this is what I'd like to see added as a number five objective: to lobby the provincial government to create and implement a curriculum in grades seven, eight, and in first year of high school, a mandatory course worth one full credit in mental health and addictions education. And the reason I come up with that is, uh, you know, I, I go over the um, like the community drug and alcohol strategy. Um, action plan and and everything is like so good that they've everything that we've come up with but there's um every, everything is reaction and nothing proactive and and i think of our kids now that are are dabbling in drugs and and alcohol and cigarettes and have no idea it's so much worse than when we were kids they have no idea what they're getting into and I just think it's time to do something bold. I know it's a big ask, but I think it can be done. Um, you know, when I think of parents, we have so many parents that are dealing with addictions themselves and alcohol and smoking and, and, and drugs. And a lot of these kids are just following in the same old path and not getting the necessary education that they need. And, and we don't have anything in place to get to these kids before they make those mistakes. And, and I don't pretend to think that this is going to fix everything, but it's it's got to get to some of them and maybe help them before they get get uh, into making some bad decisions. So let's just open it up and, and see if anyone has any comments or uh, questions on that or any of the other things listed in the terms of reference, and we'll take it from that. Dr. Eric. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, including uh, public health in this very important work. I, I echo uh, what Clark's uh, comment was about uh, uh, to be open about the multi-layer uh, th that uh, affects this, this, uh, uh, this issue or, or multiple issues that we're tackling here. Uh, upstream approaches would definitely include housing, would include uh, many of the other um, aspects and, and definitely education to younger individuals. Uh, even if, if you want to go into the long term, uh, new families with new uh, babies, uh, the first three, four years of their life will, will uh, shape the trajectory of their health. So, uh, for the terms of reference question, if we can include an item where uh, that, that uh, the, the work can be open to other layers that will be uncovered as we go forward. Uh, I, I would definitely be supportive of that. And uh, I believe Clark's comment would encapsulate that as well. Thank you for those comments. Madam Clark, you have to help me out if there's anyone, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Phil Dodd uh, has his hand up there. So. Yep, yeah, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I, uh, similar to Clark, I, I had just a typo in the in the uh, minutes. My my or in the terms of reference, my name is accurately spelled, but the organization is Keystone Child Youth and Family Services. So just a little typo there. The second thing, the question I had or query I had was, is the task force time limited uh, in scope, and if so, is that something we should add to the terms of reference. I, I'm just a, a question or query around that. Kim? I'm looking at the terms of reference. I know as, as a, a group, we discussed that this, um, you know what was in the staff report, I think, Heather, if I'm not mistaken, that, so, um, yes. go ahead. Go, I'm sorry, Kim. Um, so this um, group, Report, it speaks to a number of monthly meetings um, up starting today and including June. Um, this task force is limited um, by the municipal election happening in, in October. So um, there is an aggressive timetable laid out in the next report that was completed by Director Fady um, on a work plan. So um, this group will be talking about that time frame in the next report coming up on the agenda.
Get anything further, Phil? Any other questions, comments? Okay, um, Madam Clerk, we have a, we need to uh, pass this then, the terms of reference of the Mental Health and Addiction Task, Task Force be endorsed. Yes, Mr. Chair. Now, um, you did put a, an amendment. I'll mm -hmm. send it forward for discussion whether you want it discussed um, as included in the terms of reference or whether you'd like it um, as part of perhaps the discussion with the work plan. Um, at the next item, I'll leave that to you and, and the committee members to uh, determine that, but it would be appropriate to have a motion to endorse the terms of reference. And we will make those minor amendments that the members have um, indicated. Um, that to me is not a, an amendment, that's a friendly, something friendly that the, the clerk staff can look after. Okay, I'll ask for a mover and a seconder for this and, and I'll just leave it up to the mover if you want to add the number five that I discussed. Councillor Burley. I so move, Mr. Chair. As is or with the amendment? I, I think the amendment is proper, but I'd like to see, I really think it should go on under our next reports where I think it should be. I think we could give it better justice there. Okay. That's where I'd like to see it go. Okay, so Councillor Burley has moved that. I need a seconder. Councillor Mackey, and I'll call the question. All in favor? And that is carried. <clears throat> Okay, item number B, mental health and addictions proposed work plan. And Barb, I'll turn that over to you, Director of Social Services. Great, thank you, Chair O'Leary. Um, so I am going to jump uh, into the executive summary. So this particular work plan is fairly high level, but it is aggressive, uh, as Kim mentioned earlier. We don't have a lot of time and we have a lot of things we want to achieve. So you'll note that there was a report that I brought forward that um, Allison and I worked on and was brought to County, uh, County Council at Committee of the Whole on February the 2nd. Um, there were uh, a number of recommendations included in that and that came forward from last summer's delegation um, to Council, uh, which included a number of parties that are on this call today. Um, so today you have a draft work plan uh, that proposes topics to be covered with the uh, associated presenters. Um, we can further develop with a discussion about the key questions that we want addressed. Um, and so after we consider the information that's going to be presented uh, based on those discussions, this task force will develop recommendations uh, that strategize and identify immediate and longer term priorities. Um, that can um, support the development of mental health supports and harm reduction strategies for Gray County residents. Um, this draft, this uh, draft plan is uh, looking to hopefully to address any barriers and opportunities, as was mentioned earlier. Um, you'll note that we already have a good deal of work behind us. I included um, the mental health and addictions opportunities that were highlighted from work uh, in the Hanover Owen Sound Task Force. A lot of similarities have been found uh, for uh, based on research and uh, the community partners that were joining us for that particular task force. So they've been listed here. Uh, a was to continue to refine uh, the newly adopted protocol by paramedic services to track opioid incidents uh, to establish the baseline and monitor trend analysis. B was to map out existing mental health and addiction services offered throughout Gray Bruce communities and identify service delivery gaps and collaboration opportunities. C was to further explore urban design concepts that prioritizes creating healthy and happy communities. That was mentioned earlier as well. Uh, D was to implement the community safety and well-being plan, very connected with this work we're doing today. And E is to explore funding and resource avenues to implement additional pediatric beds at Gray Bruce Health Services. I think that came forward from some work that was done earlier with the task force for Hanover Owen Sound. And then F was to identify resource sharing opportunities to support not-for-profit um, program, um, in-program implementation and service delivery. So we think there's some ways and means to be more efficient with what we're doing. 
And then G, move forward with the calls to action that were in that previous report. And those calls to action came from AMO originally. So they are um, well established and shared throughout the province. Um, there are opportunities within that document as well in those calls to action for that larger provincial and federal policy context. So perhaps that's where some of uh, your comments, uh, Chair O'Leary, are uh, looking to, for us to make some changes in that curriculum and advocate on behalf of what we see are, are where we can make some upstream interventions. You'll see the proposed work plan does outline the meetings that are coming forward and indicates who would be uh, approached with the organizations to bring forward information. We would be talking today though about what it is that we want folks to bring forward to us. What questions do we want answered? What is it we're looking for? What are the specific pieces of information that help us to come to those uh, conclusions that we're looking for? So we've got um, in February, we're having discussions today and Allison's at the table as well as our peer support member, Sandra. We have March, we're looking at a mental health uh, addiction support and harm reduction. Um, topic in April, we're looking at the various community social supports, include, including the Poverty Task Force, United Way, Salvation Army, Y Housing and Employment, and the Community Safety and Wellbeing Planning. Um, in May, we're looking at a lens of first responders, uh, as well as other health lens, such as primary care, um, the justice sector, youth and adult probation and parole. And then in June, um, we have our final meeting uh, for supportive housing, recognizing that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, so housing first. We can't change anything in anybody's lives unless we provide them a foundation of safety, which is housing first model. And then I, there's a list of organizations that are connected with that particular lens as well. So um, at this time, uh, there are no legal requirements as of yet as associated with the work plan and the financial and resource implications are yet to be determined. They'll be coming forward based on some of the recommendations that this particular task force comes forward with. Okay, thanks Barb. Um, Kim, did you wanna speak there? Just to add, so I think um, already today, we've heard that um, maybe we need to be reaching out to the school boards and whether there's a, a rep from the, from the Blue Water Board or the, the Catholic Board um, who would like to come and, and speak to um, their perspectives on this and the kind of supports that are available in the, in the school system or what the curriculum currently includes. Um, also uh, for you, Dr. Era, we were hoping at the next meeting that um, some of the specific people around the, that are you know, members of our table here, that they could see their way clear to presenting at the next meeting. So um, Clark, uh, Naomi, um, and Phil, like if you would, would have a place on the agenda the next time to actually speak to what your insights are, but also from the health unit. But Dr. Ayer, I don't know if that gives you enough time, I know. It's been a COVID, a COVID while. Um, and if, if the health unit would prefer to be included either at the March meeting or at a future meeting. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, we, we will make time. We'll definitely make time. Okay, before we get into questions for Barb, uh, can I get a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Clumpus will move. I need a seconder. Councillor Carlton. Okay, questions for Barb? Comments? We should have had this meeting in the morning. I see right. Councillor Mackey's hand, Mr. Chair. Okay, Councillor Mackey, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just uh, before I, my, I, I raise my question, I would just like to uh, sincerely thank uh, Clark, Phil, Naomi, and Sandra for participating, and as well as Allison for providing their expertise for us as we uh, you know, work through uh, this important role. Uh, a question I have, I guess it, it stems from uh, the county's commitment that we provide to uh, our hospitals right now. Um, I think it's but 0.75 percent of a uh, of uh, our annual um, 
what, 400 and some thousand dollars, I think, that we earmarked towards, uh, you know, capital costs for hospitals, for MRIs, that sort of thing. So I have a question for, uh, I guess, Phil, Clark, and Naomi in regards to capital and uh, whether or not mental health requires capital costs. Uh, when you look at the overall funding that the province provides to, uh, to mental health, it's uh, about 7% and 10%, uh, I believe, is the, uh, the total burden of disease that uh, mental health uh, creates. So there's certainly a, an underfunding when it comes to mental health. Uh, a stat that I read is that mental health is underfunded by $1.5 billion. So I guess I'm just wondering, you know, what role does the county have, uh, you know, when we do uh, already spend uh, money on hospitals, uh, what role does the county have in maybe entertaining uh, requests from uh, uh, mental health associations? Thanks. I can jump in there. Uh, the county does does uh, flow money to us already, um, and and we have a number of positions um, in uh, housing that uh, that are funded through through uh, the county, which we are very appreciative of, and and uh, are always pleased to partner with the county. Um, the funding issue is a really significant one for the sector. We've been underfunded for some time. Uh, we uh, we survive through vacancy management. Uh, Currently, we, we are waiting with bated breath uh, on a base budget enhancement of uh, uh, at least 1%. Uh, I can get you the figures. At the provincial level, we've done some work and we can get you some figures on, on, the, uh, on that underfunding uh, and what it's cost. Uh, I think we've fallen, you know, the percentage we've fallen behind over the years. Um, but it is uh, that the longer it goes, the, the more it eats into the, our capacity and the, and the number of positions we can, we can maintain and, and fill. So uh, when I heard about the task force and, and was speaking with Kim, what really gave me hope was to have an advocate, another advocate to, to go to government to, to uh, address that issue uh, and to, to bring things up. Um, in the coming months and possibly years, I think we can only expect an increased pressure um, coming out of COVID um, with uh, for mental health, and so it's um, it, it is sorely needed. On that capital side, I I, I don't want to speak for Naomi, but certainly beds. I think would you know we we need to have sufficient number, um, but also I think in. Um, sort of tangentially, that housing issue co comes up with regard to capital. Uh, it is, it's challenging. We, we have to work with landlords. We don't have, we can't build ourselves. We're dependent on, on, the, on the market for that, but, but it does take capital dollars to, to build that infrastructure um, and making, and this ties back to the design piece um, to make it healthy housing, you know, not ghettoized housing, not housing that no, none of us would want to live in. You know, it, it needs to be, it needs to be housing that actually uplifts people and uh, and provides them with some dignity too. So, and I'll just add. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, in terms of beds, you had already mentioned the pediatric beds. We continue to try to operate two beds on our on on our women and child unit for our pediatric uh, patients that often wait in the emerge, and that is um, still no sign of funding for those two beds. Um, and ideally you would want to pull out, as Clark said, just having a really healthy environment is so important, especially for children. I think we've done a relatively good job of sectioning off a bit of the women and child unit, but uh, ideally you would really want to have a pediatric mental health unit. Uh, we're far too, well, far from London and transfers are very difficult. So you've heard from Hanover and South Bruce Gray, I understand, and, and it's an ongoing issue. Um, also, in terms of, of capital, you admit we, we are not high users of capital historically. I mean, we we're very staff focused. When I look at the hospital budgets, uh, as you mentioned, the MRI and these big pieces of machinery, generally mental health, I don't think gets a lot of the capital dollars because it's very, um, you know, there's such high demands around equipment in other areas of the hospital. And mental health really needs operating dollars. We need staff. We need housing. We can't discharge patients from the inpatient unit um, without, without housing. We need a healthy place. We need uh, 
Um, I wanted to just in terms of, of uh, I think an easy fix is uh, what we know from the Lynn capacity planning report that was done a few years ago is we need more 24 seven clinics. Well, we have none, um, but people in crisis need help when they need help. And so that ends up being the eMERGE which is not the place that we want our patients to go to. So um, is a part of the partnerships that we've developed. The SOS van with Kevin is an amazing project at putting people, um, it, it doesn't require capital, but it, it's about ac ac access, but also having uh, the Howe Clinic in downtown Owen Sound. Some, that's, uh, if we can replicate that in a, in a number of our communities, it's just really good to have people uh, be able to have access to services where when just even if we partner with other community agencies to staff it, to have a person to talk to is so important when you need that person. Naomi, that, maybe for the next meeting, but is there anything to report on um, where we are with the old baby school? Um, not really. We are, uh, we've heard this before, but we are understanding there should be an announcement in the next, uh, this week, probably. Um, the models was cut significantly um, due to requests from the ministry, um, but I still think we can make a, a great program. So we're just still waiting on that final approval. Okay, thank you. Um, just get back to Phil. I just wanted to, before I forget, when you talked about um, bringing back uh, information at the next meeting. You talked about your 1%. Um, I'd like to see dollar figures too, just so that we can see a dollar value if, if that's okay when you when you bring that back. Uh, Phil, did you have anything to add on funding? Yeah, I, I would just say in, in response to Councillor Mackey's question that that capital funding is a, is a crucial piece in the work that we all try to do in our, in our community-based sector. Um, and Keystone is the Children's Mental Health uh, Center for Gray and Bruce. And we have only recently been embedded into the Ministry of Health funding envelope. Prior to that, we were, we were with uh, Ministry of Children and Youth Services. And the opportunities for capital funding under that smaller ministry were very low. And I, I would just venture to say, and I don't want to create any issues here politically, but I'm not sure the Ministry of Health knows that we're under their umbrella yet in terms of capital opportunities. Um, but we, and, and early in COVID, the capital, um, the windows to ask for capital funding uh, had closed or were suspended. And I have not gone back in recently to see if they, they have opportunities for us to apply for capital funding again now. But it, it, is, uh, it has always been a, a forever challenge and, and one after multiple requests, we've never received uh, any capital funding requests from government in the work that we have been able to do. So it's a challenge for sure. Always funding, it's always funding. And we keep adding more and more work to it. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments? Warden Hicks. Go ahead, Mr. Warden. You're on mute. Mute, Mr. Warden. There we go. I thought I took the right button. My apologies. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to echo the comments made by Councillor Mackey and, and just share how excited I am to see <laughs> the first meeting of this uh, uh, task force. I'm really excited by the amount of talent that I see on my screen uh, here and uh, excited about the, the possibilities with uh, this talented group putting its uh, uh, our heads uh, together. Um, I'm hopeful uh, that one of the things that we'll be able to do is to make a business case uh, for, um, for mental health, for investment uh, in mental health. I think it's there, but I would love to see us have it in a, a really saleable, uh, presentable, consumable uh, format uh, that we can put out and, and make that case, not just for uh, government or potential funders, but frankly, for the community in general, uh, that, uh, you know, mental health, and I think it's gaining uh, its much needed traction, but I would love to see this group, uh, and we're already starting to get into it a little bit, 
uh, but make that business case uh, about why investment in mental health makes sense. Um, so that's one of the things I'm hopeful for. The other is, and I've been saying this all along, um, <clears throat> I'm hoping that we can identify some low hanging fruit, uh, some things that just need a little bit of a push to get it over the edge. A lot of great work has happened already. What are those things, uh, you know, those two or three things that just needs that little bit extra now to get it rolling? I'd love to see us identify um, uh, those things just to sort of get some successes and feel a sense of pride that we're, you know, getting the ball uh, rolling on some tangible uh, things. But I'll leave it there. Those are my comments for now. Thanks, Buck. Um, actually, you bring up a good point. I think Dr. Aaron and I had a discussion maybe a year ago about doing something like this. And uh, we talked about how the, the timing just wasn't right. So Dr. Aaron, I should just mention, or just have you speak on that. You think the timing is, obviously we're, we're or hopefully we're coming to the end of the pandemic. Do you, you think the timing is right for this? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I do believe that time is right. Uh, we are on the tail end of the pandemic and uh, we have the momentum of working with the community, with different partners and capitalizing on this and keeping that momentum and drilling it towards this type of emergency that's more, more uh, I believe, more costly to our society and has been there for years, not just uh, the past two years. And if I may uh, able to share my screen, I just wanna use this model for a minute. And if I have the group's blessing, I can build uh, presentation and data around it as well. Sure. Um, if I have the permission to, to share it. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So this is, uh, this is Ottawa Charter. Uh, it, it is a model that was created around 30 years ago and was a, a game changer at the, at the time and still uh, been in effect. And any time we tackle a complex issue, an issue with multiple variables, and this would, would be very consistent with the issue we have there are five uh, main approaches and there are ones that are low hanging fruit uh, to, to uh, echo what, uh, what the word and mentioned. Uh, orienting the healthcare services, that's uh, the first one there. And there is no sequence in them, but it, it is definitely for people who already fell off, off the wagon and need support, we need to, to support that group. Uh, a creative supportive environment we can we can give the right prescription and treatment to the person, but if they don't have housing, if they don't have transportation, they're not going to follow anything of that prescription or, or that treatment. Develop personal skills, and that goes hand in hand with strengthening community action. Uh, and and uh, all these four approaches are under building healthy public policy. And having the, the county lead this is the most appropriate. We know that the municipal level policy uh, changes are, are way faster than the provincial or the federal. And if we have a model that works, that could be replicated somewhere else, we're not only finding a solution for uh, Grey Bruce residents or Grey residents, we, we are finding it for many other people. And public health usually has this circle here, uh, enable, uh, mediate, and advocate. Uh, advocacy level for all these interventions Again, if, and this is, has been in the practice for 30 years, this is not new. And, and it really uh, you know, allows us to cover all the aspects that we need to cover. And if the group identifies low hanging fruit in some, or especially in the health services, this is something we can focus on in the coming few meetings and, and at the same time, not lose uh, sight of the bigger picture. Great, well, thank you for that. I don't know if that's going to spark some other questions. I just uh, jump in. I had my my hand up there, but um, yeah, to to that uh, same point, I think you're along that, those same lines. I I think uh, we could maybe consider the recommendations falling on a matrix, you know, because there are the formal services or interventions, but then there are the the less traditional. And and what comes to mind for me again is that planning piece uh, at the municipal level. Everybody, uh, all the municipalities have that, that master plan. Uh, and there's some really interesting work done, being done around um, 
I think they're called design interventions, really, which are physical, physically structuring your, your community to make it a mentally healthier place for people. Uh, so there, there's all levels can do that. And there, there was a, I'll try to find the clip. It was on CBC, but there's a, a fellow, he's a Canadian doing his PhD over in the UK, who's doing it on that as well. He's an occupational therapist by training, but focusing in on that. So um, yeah, I think, I think, again, going back to that complexity, there, there are um, many levels uh, and many interventions that we'll need to work on. So thinking of the immediate term, long term, you know, medium term and long term at, at, very, at various levels of intervention, whether it be the, the, the health care or the, the uh, you know, municipal, et cetera, it, uh, I think it, it, it falls nicely into a matrix approach. Great. Thank you, Carton. Any other questions, comments, Councillor Mackey? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Naomi mentioned about the number of uh, people that show up at our eMERGE departments and Clark spoke about uh, the, uh, the lack of uh, proper housing. I'm just wondering about what step down mechanisms are in place right now uh, when sh someone shows up uh, at the eMERGE department. What is the step down as far as supportive housing uh, that are, is involved in Gray County right now? You know, the criminal justice system uh, historically has been the uh, default housing for a lot of people with uh, with mental health issues. And I'm just wondering, how do we explore other uh, opportunities and avenues for uh, for proper housing as opposed to the criminal justice system? Mm hmm. Yeah, so we we generally any patient that comes in um, mental health and addiction patient who is is in housing crisis would see the crisis team and that would be. Um, in the rural sites, it would be the CMHA um, MHART team and it, at Great Bruce Health Services here in Owen Sound, it would be our team. And then it would, um, it, often we would then in, admit someone to our, our inpatient units or to our withdrawal management services, if that was the case. Um, we do really try hard not to discharge to the streets. So we would contact Safe and Sound, our crisis team would contact Safe and Sound and Y Housing and would try to find them housing. However, there are some people on the list that cannot get housing. And uh, I think our community, our partnerships have been very creative, but it sometimes has meant buying tents and sleeping bags and that kind of support. There's very little options for, for some of the patients coming out of the eMERGE department. So Naomi, you only admit if if the patient is willing to help themselves, correct? If they have no intentions, they're they're no, no, we admit if we think there's any risk to themselves, if we feel that they're unable to care for themselves at that moment, even if um, even like there's a lot of uh, of patients, to be honest, who let's say they continue to use. Um, but maybe there's some psychosis involved. We would feel that they are, uh, even if we're, we're, we think it might be, I'm going to just use an example, maybe it's crystal meth um, that is causing the psychosis. We would still admit because we would feel that um, it's possible that the person is not in a clear enough state of mind to keep themselves safe, especially at this time of year in the cold. I think as well, when we talk about housing, we, we have to speak about the supports. It's not, it's not simply enough to provide the housing without supports, especially with um, you know, individuals that need, need to learn how to, how to um, maintain a tenancy and, and, uh, and will need supports in that. What we have been noticing through COVID as well is that, and I think there's a general trend, and I'm sure uh, Anne-Marie has probably seen it as well, is that the behaviors um, are becoming all that more severe, um, that damage is happening more often, that it is harder and harder to maintain the housing for people because um, there is a tolerance that landlords have, and, and fair enough, you know, it, um, it's, it's they're, they're doing property damage as well. So, so it is becoming a much more a uh, challenging uh, issue, and and I think a need for um, a need for more supports in that area or interventions somehow to to some of these very very challenging cases. So. 
Absolutely. We just have patients cycling back into the eMERGE, into short-term housing. Without supports, they just continue to cycle through and they're not able to be successful in an apartment without a fair bit of support. So can I just follow up, Mr. Chair, uh, maybe you know, through you to Clark, what would a, a step-down unit from the hospital look like, a supportive step-down unit in your mind? Well, I think one thing we would have to have is capacity to receive people quickly. So, there, you know, there, there's a respecting that the pressures on the hospital uh, is to maintain a flow and um, they, they may be discharging. So there needs to be something that could be accessed quickly uh, and that would provide that individual some amount of, of support and stability. So, so a staffed unit um, that whether it be, you know, um, a number of rooms in a, in a house that's staffed 24 seven that people could land in because that's not just from the hospital, it's also from the jail. People come to the courthouse and they're, they're say, well, you're free. And they say, well, great, but my stuff's still back at Penetanguishene or whatever. So um, all those scenarios need, need rapid, uh, just a, a quick bed, you know, and, and a short term. Uh, and then um, a linkage, uh, you know, access to the supports and uh, to find the more more long term housing. So I think that's that's a, an initial step. And we don't really have that here quite uh, quite yet. So Clark, is that healthy to to put someone into a? I guess if they have nowhere else to go, but if you put them into a house where other people are struggling, uh, is that a recipe for the uh, or I'm well, just asking. So I yeah, no, understand. it's it's a it's a very good point. It is it is a risk that that we would have to to manage. Um, we're assuming that if they're coming out of the hospital, for example, that they they have been uh, stabilized and that they're ready to 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 reenter. Um, I think it, it also speaks to the staffing uh, for that that um, that unit. So I think it would need to be fairly experienced staff. You couldn't have a single staff on at one time. You'd need to have a couple of staff on and there'd have to be all those safety precautions because yeah, you, you never know what mix you might get. And there has to be some contracting, I think that goes goes along with that. Uh, so that just because they're, they're, they might be booted out if they can't, if they can't um, abide by the rules or, or, or behave in a certain way, they, they, they may end up getting ejected too. But I, and I just would like to add that then they need to be re allowed to readmit. I yeah. think. Oh, absolutely. Think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, always a low barrier approach, which by which we mean, you know, here are the rules. And as long as you're willing to uh, play by those rules, you're welcome. But if you're not, then you'll have to go, but you're always welcome back so long as you're ready to by the rules. So we always take that little barrier approach. So sad. Buck, did you have a question there? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Clark, I really uh, appreciate the comments that you're making around housing. The one point that you made that uh, resonates probably the most with me is no ghettos. Uh, mm. From someone who grew up in a ghetto, <laughs> trust me, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm all with you on that one. Mm -hmm. I think people are entitled, entitled to love and people are entitled to dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what it's all about. You, you, know, you wouldn't create a place that you wouldn't want to live in and expect other people to live, uh, to live there. So it's about decency and it's about dignity, I think. Um, what I'm learning as I hear more and more of these uh, uh, presentations and participate in discussions, and Anne-Marie will know what I'm about to uh, talk about, which is a range uh, of housing uh, that's necessary. Uh, and I had that aha moment when Barb uh, at one point talked about a distinction between uh, housing with supports and supportive housing. Uh, it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that, that there is a difference there. Uh, so we do need uh, a range um, of housing um, and I'm hearing uh, Clark, you point that out very well. Different people are in uh, different places and have different needs. Uh, and also, I'm sure that you have to consider the dynamics of who is currently, even though this might be what you need, the dynamics of the people that are in there right now aren't really, really ideal for your entrance to it <laughs> uh, right at this time, I'm sure. Yeah, I, yeah go ahead, Clark. 
Well, I just think, yeah, there are some options. Like we have um, a, a range of housing options. Uh, and one is uh, residential where we, it's congregate living. Uh, and often we have fairly, you know, long-term residents there um, who would probably be ready to graduate into an apartment, but probably not alone because they don't necessarily want to go into social isolation. The, the, the residential um, setting provides a community and, and uh, setting as well and, and all that, all the, the positives that go with that. But if we could access some, you know, two, three bedroom apartments there, there may be opportunity to graduate a number of people who, you know, get along in that residential setting on and provide some flow for us in, in our residentials as well. So different, different ways of approaching. Also, when I think of some of the homeless that are in the, in, in our areas, they are people that really do struggle to be around other people. And that's where, uh, you know, the idea of a tiny house and, and again, you don't want to ghettoize group of them, but I think that some of the other areas have done really well with little tiny house communities because some people really do better on with having their own housing without having to share their space. Great, Scott. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess my thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, when we're talking about you know step down from uh, from the hospital, I believe uh, Mr. Dodd mentioned uh, the residential program and uh, as a step down from from the hospital. So is it there's something similar to that? Could it be replicated for the adult system? I, I maybe think that question, first of all, maybe a confirmation from uh, from Phil and. Uh, if that is actually the case, could it be replicated? Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I would say, Mr. Mackey, that we, we have acted in that capacity over the years as a step-down unit to the children who are finding themselves in the hospital uh, who come into our live-in treatment program. Um, and it, as Clark identified, it, it can be a mixed bag of tricks in terms of the fit and the the appropriateness and and we've certainly experienced all those challenges uh, with a seven bed unit uh, bringing seven teenagers together can sometimes be very interesting um, and I know in your previous life Mr. Mackey you've also experienced that with adolescents in the work you do as well so um, it's uh, it, it can be a challenge but I but I think when when the opportunity is there it it's a it's a quick process of a short-term crisis stabilization assessment treatment and transition on but I, and again some of the key points made were having that ability to step up and step down so having that um, the availability to go back to the hospital if things turn into more of a crisis scenario and and have the that two-way uh, interaction is so critical in working with some of this population, uh, both child, youth, and adult. Anything to add there, Clark? No, I I, uh, I agree. I think it it is possible to to replicate that for for the uh, adult. It's a question of um, you know the bricks and mortar and the staffing uh, and the, uh, the the arranging of it. So um, the the one thing with I guess that. With the adults, there's there's always that opt in or opt out, so um, you, you can't be quite as directive um, with with the adults as you can with the kids, and uh, and so there's always that choice uh, um, element too. So. I'd, I'd just clarify on that, Clark, that our admissions to our live-in treatment program are absolutely voluntary. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a three-way partnership with the young person being one partner. The parents being the second partner and Keystone being the third partner. Mm -hmm. If anyone says no in that partnership, then it, Keystone always votes with whoever says no. Yeah. It, would, it would not happen as an admission. Yeah. You know, in, in, in talking about this and designing, it's so, it's so important to speak to those, um, the actual users of the end, the end user of the service and what would work. Um, and because there, there is that is that partnering, and and we we all bring our own um, 
perspectives, filters, values to the table and um, think what, what should work. Uh, but it, it it's always, I think, good to, to um, engage in, in a fairly robust way with the, the end user to find out would this, would this work for you. Clark, is there many success stories, people coming out the other side and, and actually making it through and straightening out their life? Uh, yeah, we can, we can, I can introduce you to some. Um, you know, it, it takes a long time. Uh, and it takes quite a range of supports. Um, you know, I think we have to stop thinking about people as our clients, but we as their providers, because they have quite a range of, of providers and supports in the community. Um, but, you know, I think of one young man who, who came um, pretty much off the streets with a significant substance use issue and behavior issues. And, uh, now has completed school and is, uh, you know, employed. He's worked through our um, um, social uh, uh, enterprise um, programs as well and is doing incredibly well as a real success story. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we can't underestimate the, the role of trauma, you know, and so it's going back to that design piece, you know, what does, what does a trauma-informed community look like? What you know, in terms of the physical structure, in terms of the, in terms of the service orientation, in terms of how we how we engage people, in terms of the public policy, what does what does that look like? Because when we're talking about mental health and addictions, we are talking about trauma too. So, um, so definitely, it it is um, it is possible. The um, but it isn't it isn't quick. It's not a quick fix. Well, I just wanted to throw that out there because it's yeah. it's good to remind ourselves that it's not all doom and gloom. And I'm, I'm sure Phil can tell some successful stories too. And and uh, it's it's good to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and some of the things that we are doing are working. And, and I think that's important to talk about too. And, and Kevin, I know you've had your hand up. I'm just going to jump in this one, one last time. There was a psychiatrist up north when I was up there and and um, often people would see a readmission to hospital as a failure. And he would often reframe it as it's just a learning experience. And so, you know, it's, it, it, we, we have to expect um, every one of us around this table, you know, has stumbled by times, I'm sure. And um, it's just part of being human. And uh, we, we, we shouldn't see it as necessarily a failure, but as a learning opportunity, and, and they will will go through that process. We all do. Right. Kevin, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I just had a couple of things. Just uh, and again, it's not really my expertise, but just some experience we have is uh, like we find really with the short term accommodation you know, late at night or in the evening or weekends or when it happens is is getting access even for a place for people to stay and uh, you know having the ability of our own place you know that could be well supported like a shelter. The other thing is to consider is, uh, is even for people that, you know, that may choose to be on the street is appropriate place for them to warm seven days a week. We don't even have access to that or go to the washroom. So uh, th those are kind of things that I think they're important to come to the table too. When we really want to meet people where they're at, that, uh, that those are some choices that they may make, but there's things that we could do to support them, to help them and maybe connect with them around that. Yeah. And I think I've uh, talked to Kim before about, about the living space model that I was involved with in in Timmins, where where it was a shelter um, <clears throat> built a, on an old um, motel, where the shelter is on the 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 bottom floor and services were on the main floor, and then we had uh, rooms on the on the top floor um, that people could could live in uh, as sort of a rooming house, and then be, get connected to a housing worker and go. But but um, I think that's a really valuable. There are all types of permute, permutations of that model, but it, um, it allows for people to come in contact with the service and to build the trust, because there's a lot of trust that needs to be built in order for things to work, so. Okay, so great discussion. Uh, I just wanna uh, reiterate that it's so important to have people like Naomi and Phil and and Clark and Allison on this committee. I think we'll, we've got a lot of work to do, but I think it's, uh, 
we'll get something done for sure. So we're looking forward to moving along with this committee. Uh, so we, if there's no other questions or comments, we have a recommendation. Sue? Sorry, did someone? Councilor yeah, I think you've got, it's, you, yeah, go ahead, Heather. So Mr. Chair, you have Councilor Carlton and then you have uh, Allison Gauvier. Okay, Councilor Carlton, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, something you kind of alluded to at the very beginning about the education component. It strikes me we're looking at a two prong issue here. The main one that we're dealing with is people who already have the mental health and addictions issues and what can we do to support them? But is there a step back or in a different direction that provides the education early enough so that people learn to recognize when I'm having a bad day, I'm having some issues. It, I relate it to somebody breaks an arm, they know to go to the hospital and get that fixed. But years ago, my mother-in-law actually had a nervous breakdown and was advised to stay in the hospital for six weeks and the family refused to allow her to stay. Said she, there was nothing wrong with her. So they didn't allow her the time to recover. And is that what we need to educate people for as well, that it's okay to have these issues and find ways to deal with them? Do we need to give them coping skills way back ahead of getting to the point that they're, they've used addiction as a coping skill for mental health? Just a thought. It, to me, I see all of this as being kind of two separate issues, but maybe we can approach both of them. Thank you. I think one of the, the items that you mentioned there really links to stigma. Um, you know, this person not, not uh, families not supporting them to get help. So I think the more we can do to promote, um, to, to promote mental health in all of our programs is really important in decreasing the stigma um, and that people will reach out. I also will flag that um, the Ontario Centre for Excellence in Mental Health and Addictions has started to roll out their plan to provide structured psychotherapy to all um, kind of the more mild to moderate family mentally ill and, and bounce backs already going on. So they are trying to expand um, services in that area and that will be coming to uh, Grey Bruce probably in the fall as well. Yeah. And then it's that that stigma piece is is huge, um, and part of it is normalizing um, mental health issues. Uh, there's a there's a, a a fellow in in Vancouver who does um, he's a comedian and he does has a program called Stand Up for Mental Health and he teaches people how to use use their own story as humor and he it's it's really quite effective it's it's interesting but. You know, his dream is that uh, one day it'll be quite normal uh, for people to come into work and saying, you know, I'm not having the greatest day. The voices are a little loud today. So it's uh, it sounds a little jarring now, but that's uh, it, it's kind of where we need to get to because nobody thinks twice about going for uh, to the hospital for a physical ailment. But um, there's a whole lot of judgment and shame around mental illness and addiction. So. Anything further, Sue? No, I don't think so. I think it, it, it really is a stigma. And I think if we could help people understand that it's okay to feel that way and there's resources available to help to get through that. There's ways to get through it before it gets to the point of using drugs or alcohol or something else as the coping skill. So. I just like to see more of that. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. All right, Allison. Thank you. I have two comments. One is a direct follow-up from this conversation. Um, it's just around uh, the education piece. I just wanted to uh, put a plug in for looking at um, more of the, the family and structural and societal um, factors that might uh, influences influence someone's uh, mental health or um, you know whether or not they develop the substance use disorder and that the public health unit can likely um, give us some education about early childhood um, or adverse childhood experiences and really how to build 
um, those protective factors around the children and the family so that substance use, um, there's less risk of substance use. Um, you know, really looking at the early childhood experiences of neglect, trauma, and abuse. And when, when you are um, exposed to that as, as, a, as a child, your, um, um, yeah, the probability of you developing a mental health or a substance use disorder increases as well. So um, I think there are a lot of environmental and structural factors that also come into play in addition to the education piece. Um, so taking it from looking at it from an individual choice per lens to a more of a structural and societal lens. Um, I, that was my first comment. <laughs> Uh, my second is is related to the work plan. Um, so I can go ahead and ask that question or if anyone else has comments on what I've just said about the childhood experiences, feel free to jump in. Well, I was I, I, I'll speak to that because uh, I hadn't even thought of that. And you know for a, a lot of this is new to me too, but you know when I talk about educating kids in grade seven and eight and nine when they're getting into it, you know what you just mentioned it, it's it's almost too late at grade seven for for the for the kids that are growing up in in whatever that is that that me and so many other people just aren't familiar with so i'm glad you brought that up the peel the drug strategy in peel region developed a framework around substance use prevention um that is a that integrates adverse childhood experience as a preventative model um, is something that I can look further into with my colleagues at public health um, and bring back to the committee if that's of interest. That'd be great. Uh, if, if I may chime in. Go ahead. N definitely early childhood uh, prevention is, is key. Uh, by age five, it's too late. Uh, kids learn to socialize by age three and four, and if the parents are very successful, that's the time where they would uh, give the child an opportunity to socialize with their peers, and kids will socialize themselves into, into a, a healthy uh, relationship down the road. And there are 30% in general of the population um, that, that would have a certain type of personality that's not agreeable, uh, where if they receive the appropriate socialization and, and uh, uh, parenthood or, or uh, uh, school experience, and they, they can overcome that tendency not to be agreeable. Uh, and, and if they have not received that, you would see how they were not able to, to um, build relationship with their peers and usually uh, go into activities that would lead to either mental health or addiction, or usually both. So uh, definitely that's not a subtle point. And, and uh, the, the um, strategies we have, all of them include not only early childhood, but during, during pregnancy uh, to, to ensure we support uh, um, especially single parents. Uh, families into ensuring uh, their kids have the opportunity to to have protection down the road. So many moving parts. Okay, Allison, did you have anything else you wanted to speak on? Um, my question is around the proposed work plan. I see under January, the drug and alcohol strategy is listed as a discussion point around a peer support member. Is that something that we'll get to sort of after, is that an item that we'll talk about later in this meeting? <laughs> or is that to be discussed as we're looking at the work plan? Barb? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that was added to the report prior to having determined who the peer uh, advisory committee member would be. But I do want to have a discussion about how um, and, and what uh, we are looking for from the peer advisory, uh, the member here, as well as the liaise back to the committee. Allison and I have had some conversation about that. 
Um, and we know how important, I've heard it here in this discussion already, we don't want to build anything without consultation, without inclusion. Uh, the experts are those that have lived experience. And I think the other piece that I'm hearing that I'm going to be so um, um, interested and, uh, it, and and I know I want to emphasize is the fact that as if, if we even have capital dollars, we need to also then look at what are the policies that surround that? What are, um, you know, are we looking at um, abstinence policies? We know that doesn't work. We know that even as we look at, you know, where we want to go with some of the advocacy for uh for addictions um, and supports. If we're really truly looking at supports, we need to look at best practice. We need to look at what is working. And I think we do need to hear from both Allison with the experience at the drug strategy, but also from persons with lived experience to know how, how the influence uh, of what we think is as the bureaucracy, if you will, and how we're laying out the foundation needs to be really tempered with what's actually being um, what will work on the ground and and what will be successful with people who are in need of this change in our community. So to go back to the actual question uh, from Allison, the comment was that um, as we put it in the document today, it was just to ensure that we understood why we had peer advisory at the table and um, how um, maybe to even hear from the peer support person themselves as to what some of the things they think. Um, Sandra's here today. Um, if, if it's possible to hear from Sandra as to what she's thinking about going forward and you know whether or not there are some early insights that you may have that can help us to, to streamline the work that we're doing. Thanks, Barb. Um, I'll hand it over to Sandra. Um, and just before I forget, Sandra, I know you and I talked on the phone about, um, you know, how we want to present this back to the peer advisory committee. You know, there's 11 other members with lived experience who meet monthly, who um, have been informed about this task force and are willing um, and open to having some to and fro. And Sandra has been nominated as the person to be that liaison and to also, you know, share from her own experience. So... I guess before the end of the meeting, we would sort of like to establish sort of what are the parameters and expectations um, from that we're looking for from this group. And, and, and if it's something that, you know, we'll figure out as we go, that's okay too, but I just wanted to, to put it out on the table. So go ahead, Sandra. Thanks, Allison. As some of you will realize, I am a Gray County employee, having shared my time in social services and paramedic services. However, on this task force, I will be bringing a grassroots approach from our peer advisory committee. As I have supported a family member through addictions and mental health crisis and recovery and have been involved with several agencies and services on behalf and with the family member. So uh, that, be, that being said, I will be also bringing back uh, feedback, ideas, and issues that are presented by our peer advisory committee when I provide uh, a synopsis back to them with regards to uh, the, uh, each meeting that, is, uh, that I am attending on this task force. Perhaps, uh, Simply said, uh, I will uh, play devil's advocate uh, for some of the suggestions or policies or thoughts going forward from, from this task force. Uh, and that being, uh, in me saying devil's advocate, just from a grassroots approach, how it may be observed or felt from somebody accessing the service. Okay, thanks, Sandra. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any other questions? Any more hands up? No, we don't, sir. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up then. We've got a uh, motion on the floor. Move by. Sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could just interrupt. Um, the warden yep. does have a comment. Mr. Warden, go ahead. My apologies, Mr. Chair. I just threw my hand up last second. Um, I, I, if I could, I'd like to go back to Allison's comment around um you know, childhood uh, it, it, and i learned uh, through meetings that the whole issue of unaddressed 
childhood trauma uh, is key uh, around you know, the, the, the symptoms, I guess, that we see around adults with uh, um, mental health and addiction uh, issues. So if that's the case, then I would love to know what are the things uh, that we need to do around addressing uh, childhood trauma? Is it ident early identification of you know, pregnancies where we know that uh, a child you know, may be uh, at risk? Is it uh, more uh, funding for uh, children's uh, mental health and, and, and counseling? I, I don't know, I'm not an expert in, in the field at all, but I, you know, it strikes me that Alison, you're raising a really important issue, which is that we need to go upstream um, and thinking about prevention um, and, and early intervention. Um, but I don't know what the answers are. Alison? Thank you for circling back, Buck. Um, I, I don't think I would do the topic justice if I tried to answer the question fully right now. I see Dr. Era has his hand up, so I'm going to defer to Dr. Era, but it's certainly something that I agree should be um, discussed more fulsomely, potentially in future task force meetings. Sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Ira, I just wanted to jump in. I'm afraid I have to sign off. Um, I have an OHT meeting to uh, attend and share, but uh, um, really thank you for the invitation to join and looking forward to working with the task force. Thank you, Clark, appreciate it. Dr. Ira, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alison, for uh, referring to the question. Uh, th there are different junctures in, in the spam of uh, any person's life where um, certain events can lead them to um, experience mental illness or addiction or both. And there is definitely uh, solid evidence in the first uh, early childhood development that, that uh, prevention can happen at that uh, early stage. What, what the system offers is Healthy Baby, Healthy Children is one of the programs that we have in the health unit where we uh, connect with the uh, families at risk and, and uh, there are different mechanisms. Some of them are passive, which is more robust, uh, whether it's referral from the hospital that the uh, risk uh, factors were identified for this family as high risk or uh, uh, through uh, family health practice or through our staff who are dealing with different uh, families throughout the, the scope of our services. And when that referral happens, one of our nurses will visit with the uh, family and uh, guide them uh, through uh, ensuring uh, risk factors are identified and, and um, the family is supported through, uh, through the period of time that we follow up with them and we connect them with other partners, whether it's uh, uh, services, uh, municipal services or, or healthcare services. So th that's where we, I believe we do the, the bulk of uh, our response to prevent uh, and provide uh, better health in the long term. Can we do more? Definitely we can do more. I believe in public health early on, it was every family, every newborn is assessed. Now it's only high risk families. So again, the system might not be perfect. Can we do something locally to, to ensure more resources are available after identification? It, definitely we could. Um, again, that's one, one part of the equation uh, around that early childhood development. There is, there is a part where before birth happens, uh, if the um, family, if the mother uh, has uh, sufficient uh, resources to have uh, healthy pregnancy, that definitely contribute to, to better outcome after the fact. So we can go upstream and that's a better approach. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, Warden. I think that's very helpful, but it sounds like we, as Allison says, uh, we probably need to do justice to this, this whole area and have a wholesome uh, uh, discussion. Most definitely. And if I may ask, uh, Mr. Chair, if, if we can get 
uh, more precise parameters around the presentation that the group would like us public health to present on whether it's the statistics or um, the, the epidemiology in Grey Bruce or a um, bit more false of um, a plan uh, from public health. I feel like there's, I feel like there's so much to talk about and so many topics and I learned a lot today myself, but um, I'm sure there'll be lots for the next meeting. Okay, uh, go ahead, Phil. No, I, I just want to apologize. I do need to step off and join Clark in the Ontario Health Team Grey Bruce meeting. Um, but I, I, I would say that if we're looking at our next meeting in March to have a more fulsome discussion, diving a little deeper in with Naomi and Clark and myself and Dr. R and others, um, it, if something is brought up in, in the next few minutes of your meeting, um, please, I'm hoping Tara, maybe you could you could forward me the, the directives in terms of what you're hoping us to, to speak to in more detail in, in the next meeting in March. I, and I'll, I'll just, there is a bit of a conflict at four o'clock every other Tuesday. So working from this timeline, uh, we do have the Ontario Health Team meetings that are written in stone. And you all have heard Clark speak. He, he's not a man that you can make him move things. So he's the chair. So he's not gonna move those meetings. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, I'm sure he would try to do that if he could, uh, but it's a large group of uh, CEOs and executive directors in the health system that, that are tied to those meetings. So again, I'll apologize and I'll take my leave um, as I should jump into that meeting and looking forward to coming back together in March and, and joining the conversation. Okay, thanks very much, Phil, for your input. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I think we can get to the motion, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, if I may, Mr. Chair, just to provide a wrap up and sort of um, direction, um, I take the comments from the, the task force um, into consideration. We have a number of stakeholders that staff had come together on, but certainly that's not an exhaustive list. And, and um, so we will be, um, working through the list of stakeholders um, as staff over the next several months. And if there are any that come to mind that are missed in this, like the school boards was, a, was an excellent idea, please feel free to let staff know. We want this task force to hear from as many um, stakeholders as possible to bring forward that business case, to look at those opportunities and provide that fulsome report at the end. So we as staff will be reaching out to the stakeholder to provide a bit of background as to what um, the parameters are we're looking for for presentations. But if there's somebody missing from that list, please let us know and we will work with them to ensure that the task force hears from them. Okay, thanks for that, Heather. So I think we've had a thorough discussion on that. We'll move on to the motion moved by Councillor Compass, seconded by Councillor Carlton, I believe, if I remember, that was a long time ago. That is so correct. We'll, we'll call the question, all in favor? Okay, and that is carried. Uh, any other business? Number six. Seeing none, the next meeting date, we don't know then at this point? No, but we will work around the uh, OHT schedule since that's a conflict for Mr. McFarland and Mr. Dodd. And, uh, will come together again at the end of March. Okay. And on to number eight, uh, we need a mover to adjourn. Councillor Burley. Of course it's Councillor Burley. Seconded by Councillor Carlton. That'd be great. All in favor? And that's carried. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care.